Committee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, members participating in a hearing remotely should be visible on camera throughout the hearing. As with in-person hearing, members and witnesses are responsible for controlling their own microphones. Those joining remotely should keep themselves muted unless recognized by the chair and should expeditiously unmute themselves when recognized. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing technical problems should inform committee staff immediately. Good morning and thank you all for joining this hybrid hearing. This hearing is entitled Building a Modern Economic Foundation, Economic Security and Income Support for 21st Century America. I uh, thank all of our witnesses and uh, some of you have testified before Congress before so you know it's more chaos than anything else. We will have members coming in and out. We will have members on, uh, uh, on video asking questions but we've been doing this long enough that I think it'll go smoothly. Um, I now recognize myself for five minutes of opening statements. So the focus of today's important hearing is on economic security programs that assist low-income families and individuals. Colloquially, people talk about this as the safety net. Those programs which are designed to make sure that our consciences aren't violated in the wealthiest country in the world, contemplating people who are struggling with malnutrition, uh, with the basics of, um, of, of living a reasonable and dignified lifestyle. These programs, of course, have a long history in this country, which is both good and bad. Some of the most transformational economic security programs started under FDR's New Deal, which created the Social Security Act and other programs to provide relief to the poor and the unemployed. Today, we have a patchwork of economic security programs, including the Earned Income Tax Credit, the Child Tax Credit, TAMF, SNAP, unemployment insurance, just to name a few, that provide benefits to people experiencing economic hardship. These programs help millions of Americans today living in poverty. In fact, uh, and this is, this is indicative of the breadth of the challenge here, over 70% of Americans report having benefited from economic security programs at some point in their lives. The financial in, uh, insecurity, obviously, as that, it, as that statistic indicates, affects uh, even more Americans, with nearly one-third of adults not able to cover, according to the Federal Reserve, a $400 emergency expense. This is not just an individual or a conscience issue. The statistics uh, show an even larger social cost. Economists estimate that the annual aggregate cost of child poverty in the United States is over $1 trillion, representing five and a half percentage points of U.S. gross domestic, gross domestic product. This committee's charge is to develop solutions to the widening prosperity gap between wealthy Americans and everyone else. Central to this goal is ensuring that struggling families and children can climb the economic ladder um, and that opportunities are provided for people that are experiencing economic hardship. As lawmakers, I think we can all agree that we are committed to reducing poverty across this country, which these programs have, in many instances, helped to achieve. Economic security programs lifted 39 million people above the poverty line, including 9 million children. Moreover, there are 83 million people in this country living below the poverty line when all of these programs are not considered, but when you layer in the income associated with these programs, that number uh, is almost half to 44 million people. That, of course, is a dramatic thing, uh, but it does not absolve us from asking the question of whether we could do better. Are these programs in, way, in any way counterproductive? Are these programs creating disincentives to what we all hope will be true, which is that everybody in America has an opportunity to prosper and climb the economic ladder? So the question is, what is working and worthy of preservation and support, and what is not working, and why is it not working? I'm particularly interested in what the federal government can do to make these programs and policies more effective, as we said in the title of this hearing, in the 21st century than they ever have been before for those who need them the most. So again, I thank our witnesses and look forward to a good uh, conversation and recognize the ranking member for five minutes of opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I thank our witnesses for being here. We woke up this morning to pretty difficult economic news, uh, hearing that we are uh, once again uh, in an economic recession uh, with our economy contracting. Uh, and at a period of time uh, when the United States has entered recessions, uh, social safety net programs uh, rise in their importance. Uh, we often see calls uh, for additional spending. Uh, I think this is really pertinent uh, that we dig in uh, and explore what programs are working well uh, so that we can make sure uh, that people that find themselves on tough times are able to trampoline uh, into self-sufficiency, into the middle class uh, in a sustainable way. 
Uh, we explore what programs are not working well, which are trapping individuals uh, in a constant state of poverty so that we can avoid uh, those errors uh, once again. Um, I view today's hearing as not uh, focused in, in particular, on Social Security and Medicare. Uh, and I say that because those are incredibly important programs, promises that we made to our seniors and promises uh, that we need to keep. Uh, but I'm staying focused uh, today, unless uh, told otherwise by the chair, uh, really on what I view as the economic security programs uh, from um, the Earned Income Tax Credit, SNAP, and Section 8 housing vouchers. And sometimes these are a real myriad and very confusing programs uh, for families to navigate. Uh, spending tops uh, $1 trillion each year uh, on these programs. And sometimes they can absolutely help pro families. Uh, but at their worst, some of these programs trap families uh, into government dependency. Uh, the last three years offers a really unique perspective to look at these programs before, during, and after the pandemic. During the pandemic, certain programs were temporarily expanded and they severed the connection to work. And the key here is they were temporarily expanded, some of which are still ongoing. And for example, the child tax credit was temporarily made fully refundable. Now we're seeing some of the data that shows the long-term impacts of severing the connection to work in particular in that program. And as the country was getting back on its feet in 2021, we saw uh, this house pass a $1.9 trillion spending bill that in part allowed workers to stay on the sidelines. And labor participation during that period of time fell. In June 2019, the labor participation rate was 62.9%. And two years later, the labor participation rate was 61.6%, the lowest since the 1970s. To some people, that, per that per the percentage drop may sound small, but that's roughly 6.5 million people who weren't working contributing to the U.S. labor shortage that we see. Let's look at another economic indicator. Data about unemployment, unemployment insurance also shows, that some change, also shows some of the changes that were made in the summer of 2021. Uh, when 21 states opted out of extending unemployment insurance that last year, their unemployment rates averaged 4.7%. States that did extend their unemployment programs averaged 6% unemployment rates. This is while millions of jobs uh, have been available across the United States. The data shows that policy in DC has a real impact on folks getting back to work, which ultimately to me should be the focus in our goal. We should start by defining a vision for success. The success of the safety net should not be defined simply by its inputs. It should be defined by its outputs. How many people are we helping escape poverty, enter the middle class, and remain there in a sustainable way? That means focusing on programs that effectively get workers back on their feet instead of measuring programs by dollars spent. So one example of this is the Earned Income Tax Credit. In some ways, it, it absolutely is helping low and middle income workers uh, when they're raising a family. There's no doubt on that. At the same time, the program lacks accountability. And I think it's an opportunity for this, com this committee to have that conversation, how we can improve accountability in particular in that program. So before we look at simply spending more money, and I suspect there'll be more and more calls for that now that the United States has re-entered uh, recession, uh, we should look at evidence-based solutions to strengthen the programs that already exist. That way programs that focus less on bureaucratic roadblocks and focus more on helping families. What about other program, what about other factors that bring families into the middle class? I think it's an important conversation for us. The data shows that there is a path to keeping young people out of poverty and helping them reach the middle class. It's often called the success sequence. So the success sequence follow, encourages finishing high school, getting a full-time job, and having a stable two-parent household. And the data tells us that if workers follow this path, there's a 97% chance they'll not live in poverty. Also, workers have an 80% chance of reaching the middle class by following the sequence. And this data shows that the answer for everything all, isn't always a new program or more spending. And I think we'll hear today from Ms. Heather Reynolds, uh, there are several options beyond simply spending more money that have demonstrated success. One area we can possibly reach agreement on is improving individual case management. I look forward to exploring that today. Successful programs should help people move out of poverty and sustainably into the middle class. I look forward to today's conversation, Mr. Chairman, and I'll yield back. 
I thank the ranking member. Before we turn to our witnesses, I ask for unanimous consent to play a video from the everyday Americans that we have been trying to emphasize in these hearings so that we don't get too lost in the, uh, in, inside the beltway here, who share their experiences as part of the committee's mission to show America to itself. Uh, please roll the video. My name is Angela Hill, and I am from Anderson out of South Carolina, and I am the founder of Journey Changes Scholarship Solutions. Journey Changers is a resource for high school students to be able to find resources to go to college with scholarships. My Startup for Journey Changes started as a high school student trying to figure out what I needed to do to go to college. Uh, my mother was not in my life and my father was not in my life, so I had to learn how to do it all on my own. It made me feel stuck and hopeless. I realized that I was lost many times. I was able to use government assistance um, such as the SNAP benefits and the unemployment um, benefits. At the time, I, I had two younger boys, and it allowed me to be able to afford the benefit of going to the grocery store. And then once I landed a job, I was able to say, okay, I don't need the SNAP benefits anymore. I don't need the unemployment because I have a full-time job. It was a building block for me. It is a resource to use to help make yourself better, make your life better, helping other students. I have realized that there were so many students now that were just like I was. There's still students out there that don't have the resources. They feel like they can't reach out to others and get the help that they need. I believe that um, the government can do a little bit more to provide um, what students need. I do appreciate the resources that are available, but I think there, there should be an extension to it. Given with what I've been through and what I'm doing now, I would say I am living my American dream. Not necessarily the American dream, but the dream that I have a passion for. And it's the dream that I will continue to live. I had struggled with drug addiction for like on and off for 17 years and I became a mother at 18 and um I was just I wasn't employable I wasn't you know I couldn't hold a job at for more than like a few months and I just didn't have any drive in life Hope Inspired Ministries really does help they really do very laid back and everybody's here so caring and you know they earn your trust it doesn't cost anything they're very involved even afterwards you know they they want to know how you're doing and I just coming up here just having somebody to talk to sometimes you know they're just it's like fa another family they train for mock interviews or whatever so you you know because I've never had a real interview before and after going through that I actually had to go have an interview at Renaissance Hotel and exactly what happened in the mock interviews that they had, you know, I was set up perfectly for that because it was exactly how they taught it. And just becoming a productive member of society has actually helped in more just from employment. Like it's, you know, taught me accountability and responsibility. And that's actually helped me with, because I have three children and like that's helped me earn their trust back. Just being able to be employed and have some kind of steady income and just being a better person. Thank you again. Now we welcome the testimony of our distinguished witnesses. Uh, first, we have Ms. Uh, Sharon Parrott, President of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Next, we'll hear from Mr. Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League. Afterwards, we will have Ms. Michelle Evermore, Deputy Director of the Office of Unemployment Insurance Modernization at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, next, we will have Mr. Indy Dada Gupta, President and Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Policy. And finally, we will hear from Ms. Heather Reynolds, Managing Director for the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you all for being here. Uh, witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. You should be able to see a timer directly in front of you that will indicate how much time 
uh, you have left. When you have one minute remaining, a yellow light will appear. I ask that you be mindful of the timer and when the red light appears to quickly wrap up your testimony so we can respect the time of the other witnesses and committee members. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Ms. Parrott, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Style, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Sharon Parrott, President of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, a nonpartisan research and policy institute. This morning, I'm going to talk about three things. First, the nation's economic security programs have made tremendous progress over the last 50 years in reducing poverty and advancing equity. Second, significant gaps in our policies remain, keeping poverty and hardship far higher than they should be. And third, Congress should take important steps to reduce economic and racial inequities and improve health and economic outcomes for everyone. So first, our progress. Our economic security programs lift a much larger share of people out of poverty than they did 50 years ago. That's due to the creation and strengthening of programs like SNAP, the earned income tax credits, and child tax credits, rental assistance, supplemental security income for elderly and disabled people, and social security. These programs have lo greatly lowered the risk of poverty and narrowed gaps between white poverty rates and poverty rates for black and Latino people. In 1970, economic security uh, policies lifted above the poverty line just 9% of people whose private income was below poverty. By 2017, this figure had risen to 47%. Second, Despite this success, our economic and health security programs have significant gaps that leaves millions of families facing hardship, both in the near term and those gaps shortchange opportunity over the long term. For example, poverty among children is much higher in the United States than in other wealthy nations. But a big reason is our weaker economic supports for families. Countries like Canada, France, Germany, and Australia have child poverty rates quite similar to ours before accounting for government benefits, but much lower rates of child poverty once those benefits are counted. We simply do less and our children are, uh, pay the price. Also, the sheer number of families that struggle to meet basic needs isn't well understood because these data usually only cover a single year in a family's life. Looking over just three years, we see that many more people experience really tough times. For example, between 2014 and 2016, so a pre-pandemic period, more than one in four households and roughly one in two black and Latino households couldn't afford adequate food, shelter, or utilities in one or more of those years. Third and finally, we know what works to help families achieve more security and to give kids a better shot at fulfilling their dreams. Programs that address poverty can reduce near-term hardship, but they also improve long-term outcomes. For example, strong research finds that children perform better academically and have better long-term health, health outcomes when their parents get help to make ends meet. And when people get access to affordable health coverage, they are healthier and less likely to have medical debt, be evicted, or face bankruptcy. There are a number of evidence-based policies, some of which were adopted temporarily in the pandemic, uh, others of which are in place in other countries or states within the United States, um, that the nation should adopt that would improve well-being in the near term and the long term. Here are four examples. We should strengthen our unemployment insurance system to ensure that, lar the, that large numbers of workers aren't left out completely or left with inadequate benefits, especially low-paid workers. The workers left behind are disproportionately workers of color and women. We should do more to help families afford what their kids need to thrive. That means expanding the child tax credit so it provides as much help to the lowest income children as it does to middle and high income children investing in childcare and preschool, and helping more families afford decent housing. Right now, 27 million children, 27 million children get only a partial credit or none at all because their families' incomes are too low. They include fully half of black and Latino children, one in five white children, and half of children, regardless of race, in rural communities. We should create a national family and medical leave program so workers get needed paid time off to care for their families while staying connected to their jobs. And we should keep moving toward universal health coverage 
By extend, extending the expanded premium tax credit, so ACA marketplace coverage is affordable, and critically important, by closing the Medicaid coverage gap so that the 2.2 million people with incomes below the poverty line who live in states that haven't expanded Medicaid can get health care. 60% of those in the coverage gap are people of color. These and other steps can build on our progress against poverty over the last 50 years, and importantly, help build a more equitable and prosperous future for the country. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Parrott. Mr. Morial, you are now recognized yeah, for five thank minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Style, and members of the Select Committee, thank you for your invitation to me to participate this morning. Uh, I'm Mark Morial, proud to serve as President and Chief Executive Officer of the National Urban League, the nation's largest historic civil rights and urban advocacy organization. I also previously served eight years as a mayor of New Orleans, as well as president of the United States Conference of Mayors, as well as a state senator in Louisiana. And in my early career was a staffer uh, here in the House and, it, and an intern in the Senate. So with 92 affiliates serving 300 communities across 36 states, the Urban League provides direct services to more than two million people annually. Our work is informed by our contact, our service to people. One of the pillars of a great nation is our respect and care for her people. This is a great nation. To truly be considered an even greater nation, we cannot leave people behind. We must offer support and opportunity for all Americans, especially those who've been excluded and marginalized. The COVID-19 pandemic increased the need for support services across the country. This Congress and the President met the moment and expanded or created key programs such as unemployment insurance, SNAP, the child tax credit, rental assistance, the affordable connectivity program, the paycheck protection program, and I could go on. This broad and quick response prevented dire circumstances including a potential severe depression, mass poverty, hunger, and homelessness to a degree that this nation may not have seen in modern times. Unfortunately, these programs are now on a path back to pre-pandemic levels or need additional funding to continue even as the effects of the pandemic persist. Inflation increases and the economy remains in recovery. As we continue to recover, we must ask, how do we meet people where they are? How do we target those who need support the most? How do we ensure that we're not helping people uh, survive? We're helping them stabilize and strengthen their economic position. We have a series of recommendations, both programmatic and systemic. First of all, we believe that each program needs a comprehensive communications, marketing, and outreach campaign to ensure that eligible participants are, number one, aware of their existence, their eligibility requirements, and how to apply. The federal government needs to use every resource available, including television, radio, social media ads, and comprehensive in-person, landline, and online assets to meet this goal. As we stated in our plan for equity and inclusion in the broadband sector, many low-income families are not connected to the internet and therefore when a program's uh, entry requirements require the use of the internet, they are locked out. We must ensure that they have options for this. There also needs to be increased investments in community navigators, increased federal funding across the board to ensure that our economic security programs, and we need to, re to address the root causes of much of our nation's need, wage stagnation, inadequate workforce development, and the like. Uh, as I close, I want to make one very important point. For two-thirds of Americans, their wages have not kept pace with inflation for the last 40 years. This is not just a question of the poorest Americans. This is a question of working Americans, working class Americans, Americans who are also in the burgeoning middle class. Their wages, their earnings, when it does not keep pace with inflation, they are forced to rely, to seek, 
to secure assistance through these programs. So these programs do not just serve the poorest Americans, which they do and must do. They also serve a broader sector of Americans. So we strongly urge that those programs that have worked like the child tax credit be made permanent, that the Section 8 housing voucher program be expanded so that every family who meets the income requirements can get the rental assistance that they need. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member, I'm available for any questions that you all might have. Thank you, Mr. Morial. Ms. Evermore, you are now recognized for five minutes. You may need to turn your mic on, Ms. Evermore. We'll uh, reset the clock for you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Style, and members of the committee uh, for the opportunity to testify today. Prior to the pandemic, unemployment insurance experts were concerned that the UI system would not be able to serve claimants effectively during a downturn and serve the counter-cyclical stabilization function that it's intended to play. Fortunately, Congress passed pandemic-era benefits that expanded access, sufficiency, and duration, so the economic calamity tied to the public health crisis remained contained. The UI system has served as a critical lifeline to workers, helping 53 million workers stay afloat during the pandemic and putting over $870 billion into the economy and staving off a more prolonged recession. However, because states started the pandemic at a 50-year low in administrative funding and had to stand up new programs quickly, Benefits did not always reach the right people on time and sometimes reached the wrong people, including organized criminals. Critically, lack of access disproportionately affects workers of color, people with disabilities, poorly paid individuals, and people on the other side of the digital divide. To put this into perspective, normally when Congress passes modifications to UI, states are given two years to stand up new benefits. Also, prior to the pandemic, the highest level of new claims on record was 695,000 in October of 1982. In March 2020, that level reached 6.6 .6 million for two weeks in a row with over 1 million new claims uh, for more than a year. During the pandemic, as states struggled to get the right benefits to the right people at the right time, heroic civil servants sacrificed tremendously. They worked significant overtime hours while under tremendous scrutiny and during verbal abuse and threats. Career civil servants at the Department of Labor similarly have competently kept this program running despite limited resources, but those resources are depleted. Particularly in state agencies, turnover has been very high, further decreasing the limited capacity. Unless we invest in staff and systems, they will be less effective in responding to the next crisis. Looking back at two key bipartisan commissions on unemployment insurance reform from 1980 and 1996, the reform principles laid out in the FY23 President's budget and the vast majority of reforms promoted today by advocates and members of Congress clearly line up with recommendations that these two commissions spent years deliberating and putting forth in a bipartisan manner. Improving federal standards is especially important as numerous studies, including those conducted by the BLS and GAO, found that workers of color experience greater challenges to accessing benefits than white workers. Given the macroeconomic effects of UI receipt, this lack of access holds entire communities of color back every time there's an economic downturn. Having said all of that, there is hope. Congress provided $2 billion to the Department of Labor to improve unemployment insurance systems to ensure the timely payment of benefits, promote equitable access, and detect and prevent fraud. While we've made considerable progress with these funds, a one-time infusion of funding will not provide the lasting changes needed. Passing comprehensive UI reform and providing sustained, sufficient administrative funding are necessary for the system to function in normal economic times and be prepared to counter recessions. The DOL is in the midst of distributing $260 million to states in equity grants, has delivered $433 million in pandemic funds to fight fraud. We've issued more than $18 million for state agencies to work with community-based organizations organizations to help uh, targeted underserved populations to navigate UI systems. Our Tiger Team initiative has deployed teams of experts to 24 states so far to improve timeliness, promote equity, and fight fraud. The DOL has committed $200 million to states to implement these recommendations. The bulk of the funding will develop a range of digital solutions for states. The initial pilots focused on claimant experience have resulted in Arkansas partnering with GSA's login.gov to supplement their in-person ID verification. Hundreds of claimants have saved hours traveling to offices. Another partnership with New Jersey involves a live reference site hosted by the US DOL that will include open source code to assist states in improving claimant experience. 
The department is planning the next round of pilots, which will continue to focus on optimizing both customer and state agency experience. The time is now for all of us to come together to ensure that we can deliver on unemployment insurance's tremendous potential. I look forward to both your questions and partnership moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evermore. Mr. Dadagupta, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Himes, Ranking Member Style, and members of the committee. My name is Indy Dadagupta, and I'm President and Executive Director of the Center for Law and Social Policy. I'm honored to come before this committee to discuss the effects of our system of social protection and how we can bolster it to ensure a basic living standard for all of us, in turn strengthening our economy and society. We likely all share a goal of ensuring widespread prosperity, good health, and overall well-being for people in the United States. Unfortunately, economic insecurity today is common, concentrated, and costly. In 2020, 9.1% of people, 29.8 million, experience poverty as defined by the Census Bureau's Supplemental Poverty Measure. Between the ages of 25 and 60, more than 60% of people will experience at least one year in the lowest 20% of the income distribution. Two thirds of people will experience a year of unemployment or have a head of household experience a year of unemployment. At the same time, economic insecurity is also concentrated, disproportionately falling on groups that have been disenfranchised politically and economically. Groups facing greater risks include African Americans, Latinos, Latinas, American Indians, Alaskan Natives, immigrants, despite their greater employment levels, women, children, and especially young adults, but also people with disabilities, LGBTQ people, people who are formerly incarcerated, and people in certain neighborhoods and counties, especially many in the South. The consequences of poverty in America are overwhelming, imposing significant costs to people who experience it, undermining their employment and earnings, worsening their health, and exposing them to greater interaction with the criminal, legal, and carceral system due to policymakers' decisions to pursue a path of mass criminalization and mass incarceration. Child poverty in particular lowers tax revenues and increases undesirable public spending, in turn hindering our nation's economic progress. As Chairman Himes noted, annual societal costs for child poverty alone exceed $1 trillion a year, or approximately 5.4% of GDP in 2018. This begs the question, why do we have so much poverty in the United States? First, our highly inequitable economy simply doesn't do enough to prevent it. The United States suffers from an unusual number of low-paid jobs, with the share of full-time low-paying jobs ranking as the 39th worst out of 42 peer nations. This, is, this extraordinary prevalence of low-paid and often unstable jobs means that many adult participants in programs supporting a basic living standard are very much working, but paid too little to make ends meet. Second, our social protection system is too modest for the actual risks people face today. When President Franklin Delano Roosevelt enacted the Social Security Act, he observed that a system of protection is necessary to guard against the hazards and vicissitudes of life. These risks, illness, disability, death, underemployment, and more, remain today and even affect those adults who grow up relatively advantaged. Fortunately, our country's social protection system does promote well-being, reduce poverty and material hardship, and ensure the foundation for tens of millions of people to thrive both for able to work adults, including many parents, and for their children. A vast array of rigorous empirical studies has demonstrated that these programs help families with low income stabilize their lives, advance in the labor market, and ensure that their children thrive. Even as these programs can be highly effective, they fall short. In particular, our social protection system could be strengthened by making permanent recent expansions of the child tax credit and earned income tax credit, closing the Medicaid health coverage gap, fully funding housing assistance, establishing a comprehensive national paid family and medical leave program, expanding assistance for childcare and long-term care to meet families' needs, modernizing unemployment assistance, establishing a large-scale national subsidized jobs program that particularly reaches our youth, and ensuring that immigrant and mixed status families can access federal support. Even as policymakers work toward these goals, they can take three steps to make existing programs more effective. Number one, Reforming requirements that undermine education and savings, like our cash and food assistance program, strict rules making it challenging to pursue higher education, and supplemental security incomes, counterproductive asset limits. Number two, shrinking administrative burdens for participants and sharing data appropriately to keep people from needlessly losing access to foundational supports. And number three, setting federal access eligibility and benefit standards while holding states and local authorities accountable as they administer and shape many social protection programs. 
Upon signing the Social Security Act in 1935, FDR noted, the need for all of us to have a basic foundation upon which we can seek out opportunity and prosper, saying, if, as our Constitution tells us, our federal government was established, among other things, to promote the general welfare, it is our plain duty to provide for that security upon which welfare depends. The simple lesson from history and research for policymakers is this. Economic security is the foundation for economic opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dadagupta. Ms. Reynolds, you're now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Stahl, and members of the committee. As the Managing Director of the Wilson Sheehan Lab for Economic Opportunities, or LEO, at the University of Notre Dame, I have the rather peculiar credentials of serving at an academic research shop as a social worker. I spend my days surrounded by economists who care deeply about using rigorous evidence to solve poverty. Why do I serve here? Prior to joining LEO, I spent almost two decades as the CEO of Catholic Charities Fort Worth. The clients we had the honor to serve are people who taught me about poverty. They taught me about struggle and strength. And they taught me about what an incredible disconnect exists between policy and on-the-ground work. It is through that experience that I learned my first lesson in poverty-fighting work. The faces of poverty all look a bit different. Take Marcia, a single mom with three children, living in a place that no one should ever call home. Over $800 a month, yet her rental had no running water. Her $10 an hour job didn't cut it. Or Simon bravely served our country in the Iraq war. Simon began self-medicating his trauma with drugs and after getting caught, went to prison. Or Ali, Ali will never hear the word Taliban without falling to his knees because the Taliban killed his family. At 16, he was brought to the United States wearing the label of unaccompanied refugee minor and lived in foster care. Or Randy, a young adult who is significantly disabled, yet able to work. His mom can't afford to get him to and from a job. Each of these individuals wants upward mobility. Getting there, though, is a whole different story. Which brings me to my second lesson. If the faces of poverty all look a bit different, then maybe the solution should too. What I think most of us want across partisan aisles is Americans to have a life with a good job, good home, good schools. Solutions to get to this are often reduced to simplistic framing of give cash or get a job. They don't cut it. Solutions must meet people where they are and help them on a path, often that takes several years and multiple supports. For Marcia, she needed childcare and support so she could get credentialed to earn higher wages. Simon need, needed mental health services and a home. Ali needed help completing his education. Randy needed a job that wanted him and transportation to and from it. Which brings me to my third lesson. Comprehensive approaches must be key to solving poverty. In my role at LEO, I have the privilege of seeing the most innovative poverty fighters that realize decades of business as usual have left them with a scant understanding of what works. It's not all that easy to run a social service agency and bring in researchers to run randomized controlled trials to test if what you pour your heart into actually works. I'm talking about causal evidence building, the kind that tells us the direct effect of programs on the intended outcomes they're attempting to change. The evidence points to comprehensive services. The Goodwill Excel Centers aim to provide adults with a high school diploma surrounding them with supports. But does it work? In comparison to those who do not get this program, students are 11% more likely to be employed in the formal sector and earnings are 39% higher. Take Catholic Charities Padua, which provides holistic case management to move people out of poverty. Does it work? People experience a 25% increase in work. For those not working at the time of enrollment, a 67% increase. Or take student success programs. Two thirds of students enrolled in community college do not achieve a degree within three years. The issue is not access, it's completion. What happens when you comprehensively support a student Eight model programs have been rigorously tested and show tremendous gains in completion. Which brings me to my final lessons. Programs must be backed by evidence that they work. The war on poverty started over 60, almost 60 years ago, and we're fighting the, the problem with over a trillion dollars a year in largely the same ways, without knowledge of what works and for whom. 
Yet for some reason, we trade the quest for data-driven solutions with well-intentioned efforts or value-espousing ideas all on behalf of the poor. We then scratch our heads and wonder why upward mobility isn't possible for a good number of Americans. Policy must demand that we test what we're doing for the poor. Understand the causal impact every dollar. Use that evidence to double down on what works, stop doing what doesn't, and where we find gaps, keep building evidence. People living in poverty deserve programs that work. Evidence honors their dignity. Marcia, Simon, Ali, and Randy all present unique needs that require different solutions. Evidence gives power in our fight against poverty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Reynolds. I now recognize myself for questions. Um, I've got a couple of big questions without a lot of time, so I'm going to ask for fairly, uh, fairly snappy answers. Um, the, the, the first question I have, um, the ranking member made reference to this in his opening statements, and it's an argument that we have in this building a lot, which is, do these programs create a disincentive for work? Now, I've heard a lot uh, that the economic impact payments, that expanded CTC, suppress the labor participation rate. I don't see that supported in the economic studies, but I'm open-minded about what those of you who marinate in economic statistics can tell me about that. Is there clear evidence that, that narrowly speaking, the COVID aid suppressed employment? Because obviously there were some other things going on, like a pandemic, um, but also more generally, where and, it, it, where and if um, is, there, is there an effect where employment is, uh, is suppressed by, by, by cash aid? I think we have to look at the economic numbers. Right now, unemployment is at 3.6%. It took a minute for the recovery to take place, but compare the recovery post this economic downturn to the recovery post the 08, 09, and 10 downturn. It took far longer for the unemployment levels to come back down. And so in a moment, there were suggestions that higher unemployment somehow disincentivized work. What our uh, experience showed is that it was something different. It was childcare, it was transportation, it was schools not being open, it was a impact, particularly a lower wage workers, particularly women, who had to make a choice between childcare and going back to work. However, look at where we are today. Uh, the unemployment levels have come down uh, precipitously uh, in this country. So I think that uh, we have to be very careful uh, making the exception, meaning a person here or a person there, who may choose to game the system, the rule, uh, when there's no evidence to suggest that. So I think the evidence shows it took a minute for the labor market to recover, but that the circumstances were not, if you will, the fact that the uh, enhanced unemployment was keeping people out of the workforce. I think. Thank you, Mr. Mario. I've got a bunch of other questions, so let me just tie this one up with: uh, Are there any other witnesses? I guess what I'm looking for is there any academic research that suggests that the existence of these programs does, in fact, create a, a disincentive to employment, Mr. Gupta? Hi, uh, thank you, Chairman Hines, for the question. Uh, while there is uh, some research showing that some parents, in particular, but some other adults, might modestly reduce uh, employment and earnings, uh, the overall body of research shows quite clearly that programs like Medicaid, SNAP, Head Start, for the second generation especially, uh, dramatically increase uh, their uh, labor market outcomes, their educational outcomes, and there are programs like uh, paid family medical leave uh, in the state of California in particular, and the Earned Income Tax Credit, and others that quite clearly uh, increase some people's work. There's even some evidence of that with Medicaid uh, for the same generation. So looking holistically at uh, these programs, as a ranking member style used the metaphor of a trampoline, they absolutely are a trampoline. Okay. Th yes, Ms. Reynolds, quickly. And, and the only thing I would add to that, though, is like take Marcia, who I talked about in my testimony. She was on SNAP when Catholic Charities Fort Worth found her, but it wasn't SNAP that trampolined her. SNAP helped meet a very basic need for her and her family, which was important. But what trampolined her was the services she was getting at Catholic Charities Fort Worth, Padua, that was helping her get on a journey, navigate the complexities that she was dealing with, and put her on the path out. So but, I think it's. But in important that particular case, it sounds like you're saying that the Catholic Relief Services was the, the, the thing that made the difference, but it also sounds like you're saying that that SNAP was a, a, a pretty critical foundation for her. 
Catholic Charities is what made the difference. And I would say, yes, there are times where public benefits is shown to really help somebody. The problem is that a public benefit is not designed to trampoline someone right. out. Right. What it's designed to do is help them feed their children today. Right. And I think what's so important is we have to help people feed their children today and trampoline them out. Thank you. I'll probably come back to that if I have time, but I've got a couple other areas I want to explore. Um, so I'm going to uh, start with Ms. Evermore on that, but then let me, let me open it up. Um, you know, we'll have lots of arguments over here about the size and the nature of the programs. One of the things that has always made me crazy is the utter fragmentation of these programs. So, you know, an individual who may be struggling for a whole variety of reasons now needs to go to one part of Bridgeport to sign up for SNAP, another uh, volunteer organization to get the earned income tax credit, and they may not even know about the availability of Medicaid. To me, that just seems like something we need to solve. So that there is a point of contact in a culturally or socioeconomically appropriate way that people can go in a very simple way, sign up for those benefits that they are entitled to. So let me start with you, Ms. Evermore, since you've got the sort of federal perspective. Who is taking the lead? First of all, is that concept as important as it feels like to me? And secondly, who is taking the lead to try to migrate in that direction? I really think we all need to work together on that so that there's no wrong door. So that when somebody comes for assistance through one program, they can easily find their way through to other programs. And one of the things that we're kind of hoping to do with the digital services work that we're working on is ensuring that once somebody applies for unemployment insurance, that information can then be made available and, and they, are, they are notified of their uh, potential eligibility for SNAP, for, uh, you know, uh, registering with the exchange for other programs. Does that exist today? It doesn't. Okay, when's it going to exist? It will take a long time. A long time. Why is it going to take a long time? Why, if I can order a book and a car and, and dinner on this thing and have it all arrived in 20 minutes, why is, it, why is that going to take a long time? Well, when it comes to unemployment insurance in particular, we have 53 separate systems all operating in different ways, all interacting with different systems in those states in different ways. Um, I think fundamentally, if we were able to establish a floor uh, for unemployment insurance uh, benefits uh, nationally, that would take us a long way toward being able to standardize benefits across states. But right now, there's just so much difference across states. No, and I, and I understand that, right? Um, but it sort of feels to me, and back in the day, Oklahoma was actually making some real progress in sort of one point of access. So should the federal government be urging, incentivizing, you know, maybe even twisting some arms to get states to provide one point of entry? Absolutely. Um, okay, I'm almost out of time, but I, I this is, say, the, yeah. The best point of entry for people are community-based organizations. This is something we do. You come yep. to us, and we will assign a case manager to you, and we'll assist you in applying for unemployment, enrolling in SNAP, uh, finding out about TANF. Uh, uh, but uh, the resources to do that, the ability to, uh, if you will, serve the volume of people uh, doesn't exist today. So either you've got to build it inside a government, or government should outsource it to community-based groups to be able to do. Uh, I suggest that uh, a combination should be done. Sometimes community-based groups are seen as being on people's side much more than going down to a government office building uh, to try to se secure services. But you identify a very significant problem. In the long run, a comprehensive, if you will, uh, website or social platform uh, that is comprehensive in nature could be helpful. But uh, I think as Ms. Evermore talked about, when you have 53 separate systems uh, and you have this fragmentation amongst both federal departments and state agencies, it's uh, very difficult to be able to do that. So I think in the short run, a focus on the community-based model Thank you. The best uh, thank you. I've, I've gone way over my time, so I, I may come back to this if we have the opportunity, but I will recognize the ranking member now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Dudagapta. Uh, Gupta, apologize. Um, you, two years ago, you noted uh, in, in a tweet that we, quote, literally need to spend our way through and out of the recession. Uh, deficits uh, may never have been more desirable. Austerity may have never been more cruel and counterproductive. Uh, we're officially back in a recession uh, with the data as of this morning. Uh, do you think it's important to spend our way uh, out of the recession and uh, of deficits still uh, remain uh, never more desirable in your opinion. Thank you, Ranking Member Style. Um, the United States had what appears to have been the fastest, no, just, uh, uh, we, robust we're, economic we're, we're, we're tight on time. Do you, do you think at this period of time, knowing we're in a recession, that we should sp continue to spend uh, our way and deficits uh, are not a concern? I, I think we can pay for what we need. 
Okay, very good. To, it, rough, roughly, here's my concern. We, I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but I'm really just concerned about the spending that we continue to see uh, here in Washington. Uh, and Mr. Morale uh, brought up a really, I think, a really important point when he noted the impact that inflation's having uh, across the board where wages aren't keeping up with inflation and people continue to fall further behind. Uh, and it's noted that those who are falling the furthest behind are often uh, the least amongst us. Uh, and so I'm concerned about how um, we have not addressed the, the spending and the recessions. And so uh, I flag that. Let me jump over uh, to you if I can, uh, Ms. Reynolds. Uh, we, we threw together uh, what I think is a real simple, easy to follow map. Uh, maybe others will disagree. I say that obviously in jest uh, for the record. Uh, this is a, a, a best take at the myriad of programs uh, that we have. I'm thinking about some of the people uh, that you referenced in your story that you have personally interacted with. I could walk through people that I've interacted with who are navigating through some of these programs, Kenosha, Janesville, uh, across southeast of Wisconsin. Seems darn complicated. Uh, we look at the opportunity to spend more money. Uh, we don't really talk about simplifying the programs so that they truly help individuals in need with the ultimate goal, not of being the inputs. The goal is the output, bringing people out of poverty, Walk me through how this map can confuse the heck out of somebody, or tell me otherwise that this is pretty darn good and it's simple and it works really well. You know, I'm really glad you didn't ask me to walk you through that map because um, that map always stresses me out. I, when I, I see only it. have five minutes. Yes, um, when I think about uh, my time at Catholic Charities Fort Worth, that map is what we saw our clients experience every day. It is very difficult to be poor and try to navigate that system. Um, I'd say a couple of things in response to your question. I think a lot of that. Um, does need to be changed in a way that makes it a lot easier for navigation. I love case management. I am a big fan of case management. I'm a big fan because I saw it work as a practitioner, and I saw it. I see it work in the evidence that we produce at Leo. The problem is, though, you have master's level social workers being case managers, and oftentimes they're spending their time navigating that. So we're paying for that system, and we're paying for people to navigate that system where you want those. MSWs focus on helping clients with the trauma that they have undergone, helping them set goals, helping them move forward, helping them on a path to self-sufficiency and to upward mobility. We need many things on that map. We need it easier from the point of view of the people, not from the point of view of the programs. Could you, could you walk me through a program that you think is, has limited bureaucracy that works well, that is a little more simplified, and maybe point out one that might be at its worst that this committee should look at and say, boy, Boy, could we simplify this? Yeah, I think always one of the best examples of anti-poverty uh, program in the United States is um, the refugee program match program. Um, I think that that is a program that you will find on your chart that um, is, is extremely uh, streamlined. It's a place where uh, community organizations are leading those uh, programs and receiving those federal funding, but their job is to comprehensively support the refugee family that has arrived in our country. We've done it there, and you will see high success rates in that population. The evidence keeps pointing to comprehension, and programs that can um, do comprehensive services are what we see works. It, knowing kind of the economic environment we're in, we talked about uh, the inflationary environment. I have grave concerns about the recessionary environment. We've now uh, confirmed that we're in as the pain people are feeling. Uh, how will people's dependence on some of these social programs uh, change in the in the weeks, months ahead? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I um, I think some of the people, people in poverty and then also our providers that we have the privilege of working with at Leo are going to be hit hard by what we see right now. What I would really say, and this is from my past experience of a provider and dealing with the 2008-2009 situation, is it's You've got to, as a provider, meet people where they are. You've got to meet them with their basic needs. Maslow's hierarchy helps us understand that is really important. But we can't stop there. And I remember as a provider, we use that as a time to meet people where they are, but then also people who were out of work, people who were in situations, that was a time we got them skilled up, we got them credentialed. So when things lifted up and jobs were available, they were positioned really well, not just to have done better in their poverty, but actually to have a way out. I think if we look at evidence that has been created by many projects that have been focused on community college success and completion, uh, 
uh, NPOWER, Goodwill Excel Centers, Catholic Charities, Padua, we will see that a comprehensive long-term look at this is really what can make a difference. Thank you very much. I appreciate your passion. I think we, uh, uh, and the, the energy across the board, I think we all share a similar goal to help people uh, who find themselves in challenging times. We obviously sometimes disagree on the policies. I appreciate being here, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, Ms. Kaptur is recognized for five minutes. There it is. There ah, go. great. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and thank you to our very gracious witnesses uh, for your testimony today. Um, my first question involves uh, intergenerational poverty. And uh, if any of you have particular knowledge about that, and Ms. Reynolds, you used the term trampoline, I, trampoline, I like that. Uh, in terms of intergenerational poverty, what do you see as a the primary trampoline uh, from your experience, from your vast experience, to help people in the newest generation succeed? Nothing is worse than running a social service organization and seeing repeat customers, because it means you failed, or seeing multiple generation of clients come through your doors. Um, there were times, I'll admit, we saw that when serving at Catholic Charities Fort Worth. I'd say the biggest trampoline for exit of generational poverty is really about finding out a family's hopes and dreams for their future, getting them on a pathway to prosperity and supporting them in all the many ways they need to be supported to get to that place of upward mobility. Because we know oftentimes children who grow up in poor families end up becoming poor themselves. i just add that um, there's some really good news here actually. Um, uh, I know that sometimes it feels like there's a dearth of good news. There's actually some really good news that over the last decade, there has been a tremendous amount of research done that has shown that when we invest in families, when we help families lower their poverty, improve their economic security, that is not just about lowering hardship, which is a great, important thing to do, but it has long-term positive effects on kids that make it more likely that they attain more education, that they have better health, and that they are set up to succeed in, a, in an important way going forward. So while it is really important, as you've heard, to have comprehensive supports and case management to help people navigate, we have broad-based research that's looking population-wide at large-scale programs that provide income assistance, and what they show consistently across the board is that it makes a real difference for children's trajectories and that investing in families with kids and investing in kids today, income support to stabilize the family, to reduce those moves that are so disruptive for kids schooling and to have high quality childcare and early education, all of those things have positive evidence about what they do for kids' futures. I was, I'm very taken by your, your comments. Uh, all of you, but uh, particularly that there's some sign of progress. I know in the communities that I represent, one of the most harmful uh, aspects of community life for those whose um, incomes are not high is the lack of housing and the fact that the children are in three schools uh, in a single year. And by grade three, it's completely predictable. They can't make it because who could, a tomato plant couldn't be surviving if it were uprooted that many times. Uh, and so, uh, 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 Mr. Morial, I'm impressed with your testimony as well. I like your idea of community-based support of uh, services and of ad advice. Um, on the financial side, we find financial deserts, however, all over this country, and one of the most effective mechanisms I have found in my own work is the community-based Community Development Credit Union, which uh, is, exists in many financial deserts, not enough in my opinion, and provides advice to people rather than depending on predatory lenders and financial exploitation, which is rife in the state that I represent. It may not be true around the country, but how can community-based credit unions factor into helping families have a really reliable source of financial information to help them secure uh, uh, a present and a future that is more stable? Uh, th thank you for the question. And I think community-based credit unions are part of uh, a community level infrastructure, not broad enough, not wide enough, not comprehensive enough that 
helps people understand the complexity of the financial system. Some may call it financial literacy. Yeah. We do this work through what is called housing counseling, which is a financial literacy initiative uh, funded by a combination of public and private dollars. It's one of its end goals is to prepare people to become homeowners, to get them ready, uh, to get them educated, to, to, to provide them with information about the mortgage market. Uh, Community-based credit unions and others that work with people and provide people with the education they need, uh, with the exposure they need to understand the financial system makes them far better off and allows them to make uh, better informed decisions uh, about their own financial outcomes. Sometimes it's as simple as what phone plan uh, to purchase, uh, the difference between various forms of mortgages, uh, how to make a decision as to whether or not you can afford a mortgage. For many instances, these are people who are rising from poverty. Yeah. They're in the stable working class and uh, they're trying to move to the more secure working class. So uh, those initiatives, I think one thing I'll say in our experience is that one of the challenges we face is that the scale of these initiatives is not broad enough. Yeah. Their impact is significant, but their impact does not reach the large number of people who are in need. Yes. Uh, one instance may be people may not know about it, but I think a broader, a broader observation I, I make is that they simply just don't have the reach. Is it not enough funding? Is it not enough commitment? Whatever it is, they don't reach far enough. And the only thing I'll say is these are the kinds of things to go to your intergenerational poverty question. Uh, that help people take the next step to economic independence, to become a homeowner, to understand uh, how to navigate, uh, to have a bank account. Yes. Those are important steps. Mr. Mr. Mario, the gentlelady's time is well expired. I want to show my colleagues and the other witnesses uh, yeah. equanimity here. So uh, we may have a chance for a second round, but um, uh, let's try to stick more or less to time. And with that, I'll recognize Mr. Donald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Real quick, this is one of the reasons why I do not like the way the House conducts committees, because the five minute back and forth doesn't allow for true dialogue. Um, I've stated that in the past, I'll say it again. If members are allowed to chime in and out with witnesses, you actually accomplish a lot more in a lot shorter amount of time. I love efficiency, we don't do that here, um, but that's just me. Um, a couple points, number one, the single point of contact with respect to being able to get the different assistance that you need. Um, is critical. Let's just be honest, the failure is bureaucratic failure and legislative and regulatory design. That is why we don't have single point access because every office loves their office and every office specializes in their office and the other offices don't wanna be able to come, don't wanna be able to give up their cheese to somebody else. Those are the facts. So if you were gonna have to, if, you were, if we were gonna move to a single point system with respect to um, uh, uh, benefits in the, in the United States, we will have to have a complete redesign of the federal infrastructure here in Washington. I'm game for that. Like, I'm all for it. So if my colleagues on the other side or my colleagues on my side of the aisle want to get in that business, let's go. Because probably what we would find is the rampant amount of waste, the rampant amount of, <clears throat> of, of in some respects, fraud, the rampant amount of just lost time where information is not getting to the people who truly need it at, at the time that they need it. You're talking to, listen, when I was growing up, Section 8, yup, WIC, yup, food stamps. I don't, I don't say SNAP, I say food stamps because I had the book. You ripped the thing out and that's what you took. I had that. So I've been through that. I know exactly what it is. My mother went through those steps in order to keep things afloat for us when I was going through um, middle, middle school and high school to then be able to matriculate and do all the other things we were able to do. So I'm fully supportive of single point. We should be doing that, but my colleagues need to understand that's not a talking point. That's a serious restructuring of the federal bureaucracy, something that is long overdue, something that we've never really done because that's Washington. Um, a couple of quick things. Mr. Morial, you talked about financial literacy. Um, I would argue, and I agree with you 100%, I think that the banking community and the financial community is in lockstep agreement with you and I think people need to understand financial literacy, what it causes, it brings more Americans into the fold to potentially be customers. So let's be honest, that's what's in it for the financial community. But it's, it's critical to unleashing the economic aspects of Americans. In my state, we've started the process of making financial literacy be a part of graduating high school. 
we should go significantly further. It should be taught, in my view, the, your last three years of high school, because those are the building blocks every American child needs to be successful in the country going forward. Um, my concern, and, and Ms. Ms. Parrott, I'm gonna come to you. Um, my concern with some of your with some of the policy proposals is that as of this morning, we are now in a recession. And I know that there is debate amongst the economic community about what has caused our current economic situation. But I know full well going to a 7-Eleven in my district at the, at, at the end of the pandemic, depending on when you want to mark that, but at the start of expanded UI, the people were offering $500 for you to come in and apply at a 7-Eleven. $500 just to come in and apply. That was happening all across the United States. 7-Eleven, McDonald's, Popeye's, whatever you want to call it. There were not enough workers showing up to actually do work. And so the economic situation, my concern with some of your policy proposals that it creates is that you are actually providing cash assistance directly to, to individuals, but there's no exchange for productivity in the economy. And if you have lower productivity in the economy, you have lower product in the economy. And if you have lower product in the economy and lower productivity in the economy, even though you've addressed the cash needs of individuals, you then create an inflationary pressure in an economy, which actually then unwinds the, the wage gains that you might see at the lower end of the economic spectrum, because now their wages are basically lost because um, product costs are much higher. I don't know if you want to comment on that in my last 40 seconds. Sure, I'll just say a couple of things. So the first thing to say is that um, labor force participation actually has rebounded quite strongly. Um, it did take a while. There are lots of reasons for that. But there were lots of concerns about labor force participation. We're back very, very close to pre-pandemic levels. And it's really important to look at labor force participation among working age adults. As the, econ as the population ages, overall labor force participation, when you look at everybody, including older people, mm -hmm. is going to trend down. But when you look at labor force participation among prime age adults, 25 to 54, you see we've really rebounded in an important way. So that's one thing. The second is there is a balance. We need to make sure that the lowest income kids have what they need so their families are stable, they have food on the table, a roof over their heads so they can thrive. And at the same time, we need to put those building blocks in place that help people succeed in the labor market. That's what people want. It's not as though that's not what they want. And in fact, when we do things like combine the earned income tax credit, that where you get more as you work more, child care so that people can afford to go to work and know that their kids are well cared for, and family and medical leave, which is tied to employment, those are things that can help people work, and we can do those things while also making sure that we don't have children mired in deep poverty. Thanks. Quick point, Mr. Chairman. I hope we have a round two. I agree with my colleague from Ohio. We shouldn't be uprooting kids every three, every single year. Uh, that's why we should be going to school choice so parents can actually pick the academic environment for their kid and they don't have to move them. I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. Moore is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I just want to thank the witnesses for, um, for appearing here today. Um, I agree with Mr. Donald that we, there's so much to say and ask in so little time. I just want to sort of respond to some of the things that I've heard today from our witnesses and from our my distinguished colleagues with regard to there not being a one-stop shopping for the benefits that people receive. That was done deliberately. When we ended the uh, aid to families with, uh, with uh, dependent children's program, and maybe Ms. Parrott, you could... Um, you could tell me if I'm right or not. We deliberately disaggregated those opportunities where you couldn't just fill out a unified uh, application and get all those benefits. Is that is that am I remembering that correctly? Well, I think it's certainly the case that um, when when the Aid to Families with Dependent Children program served a larger swath of poor families with children, it often served as an entryway into multiple benefits, and people got connected that way. I will say that you know there is some innovation and progress out there at the state level, um, where states are doing more. Some states, not all the states, um, are doing more to uh, to help people connect to multiple benefits through. 
uh, portals, through single applications, and through the use of technology. So it, we are a long, a long way away from lots of doors that all get you everything that you need, for Thank sure. You. But there are some bright points out there. Thank you so much. And, uh, Mr. Morial, I really do want to thank you for appearing here today. And I'm going to ask you some questions related to other testimony that has been made. Um, we've heard a lot from our colleagues about um, the workforce participation rate and people not wanting to participate because we've given them stuff like unemployment compensation, uh, that somehow we are incentivizing people being uh, lazy and so on and so forth. I, I do want to, and I read your miserable report every year about black America and, <laughs> and, and how um, disadvantaged uh, um, we are. I just want to ask you, about the fact that we have not increased the minimum wage for 13 years is stuck at $7.25 an hour. Um, in addition to the earned income tax credit really not being adequate, as a matter of fact, uh, I was fact checked by this and the Center for Budget and Policy uh, Priorities was one of the agencies that uh, sort of backed me up. Um, that we're taxing people into poverty. Some people are so poor that the amount that they pay in payroll taxes and other taxes, they're actually taxed into poverty. Uh, and, and also, we don't allow, as you pointed out, Mr. Dutta Gupta, we don't allow education and training uh, in order to, as you would say, Ms. Reynolds, trampoline people out of poverty. People are stuck in poverty. And it's not because we provide them with benefits, as some of our colleagues assert. It's because we have these high marginal tax rates and program requirements that don't allow people to get out of poverty. We're forcing people uh, into jobs uh, that are temporary jobs and really not uh, creating a ladder to success. So that being said, Mr. Yeah. Mario, I just would like to know yeah, so um, if, I, if you agree with some of our colleagues that the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, um, some of these programs are uh, locking people into poverty and it's people's lack of character in some way, they're not know, married, other things I, that are uh, causing poverty. I categorically reject that thinking. Oh, okay. And I'll tell you why I categorically reject that thinking. is because I've been around a little while. It's part of a cruel stereotype that just seems to circulate. And the stereotype is cruel. Somehow that people are lazy, that they don't want to work, that uh, any way to game the system, they'll take advantage of it. It's cruel. It's, it's, it's time to end that kind of stereotype. It's the same thing as if we said that all wealthy Americans are greedy and own yachts and want to game the stock market. We need to discontinue that. Having said that, you're right. The fact that the minimum wage has not been increased by this Congress now for more than 15 years is an outrage. Um, and, let, me, uh, let me let Mr. Gupta uh, finish. I just want to ask about inflation. Is it true that this inflationary and maybe recession that we're entering in is caused by our, the American Rescue Plan, our saving people from uh, catastrophic uh, poverty, um, the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, the checks? Is that what the cause of the current inflation is uh, in your, from your point of view? Representative Moore, thank you for the question. Uh, there are a number of causes, and there uh, are a, a, a number of solutions that Congress itself, rather than the blunt instrument of the Federal Reserve, I think can address uh, inflation through. I will just note that the American Rescue Plan did lead us to the fastest economic recovery, jobs recovery, of pretty much any country entering the pandemic, certainly any rich country. And the counterfactual of not having passed the American Rescue Plan would have been quite devastating as well. We took over 84 months after the last recession to close the jobs gap, meaning creating enough jobs for people who lost them and new people entering the labor force. This time, it's taken us about 28 months. And that is absolutely life-saving and has promoted the livelihoods of folks but we can still address inflation going forward, thinking about things like the cost people really face for childcare, for long-term care, et cetera. That, that, that's 
called a gavel. <laughs> um, so I was wondering without objection, Mr. Chairman, um, could Mr. Gupta, for the record, submit um, his assertion that we're 39th out of 42 uh, among OECD countries, I presume, in terms of having the worst jobs? Without objection, so ordered. Um, again, we may try votes dependent to do a second round. I understand the five minutes is constraining. And by the way, so the witnesses know, three of the members of this committee are also on another committee that is voting right now. So us going back and forth is not rudeness to you, but trying to do, serve on two committees at once. Uh, with that, and, Mr. And, and Mr. Chairman, I just would like Ms. Reynolds to get a little bit more energized and a little bit more. <laughs> The, ge the gentleman from Ohio, Ms. Davidson, is rec Mr. Davidson, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thanks to our witnesses, and thanks for the work that your efforts are, you know, intended to do is help so many people who do struggle with, with poverty in our country. And it, it is a huge priority for our, our citizens, for our government. Frankly, we spend about a trillion dollars a year across roughly 90 programs uh, to provide a social safety net for means tested. So we spend about another just under $3 trillion uh, for our retirees between Medicare and Social Security. Uh, it accounts for the overwhelming percentage of federal spending, frankly, is to um, alleviate the challenges of the cost of living. Uh, of course, retirees save their whole lives for this. Uh, every time they get a paycheck, uh, they're paying for, in the case of Social Security, a benefit that generally could be outperformed with virtually any other form of saving. Um, but when you combine it with Medicare, Medicare is chronically underfunded. It pays out far more than it collects. And both funds have been rated. They're not kept sound. And I, I just say that it's time for Congress to make those funds sound, actuarially sound. And that will involve some reform, but none of those reforms should involve any diminishment of benefit for current retirees. Uh, we have to look at what we can do for the future, but frankly, it's the same as a pension fund in the private sector. If you've promised it, then you have to fund it. If not, you're guilty of fraud. So I'd hate to think that Congress is defrauding our retirees by underfunding the pension obligations they're being promised. So that aside, mostly we're talking about um, the, the $1 trillion, the social safety net, the 90 programs. And I was just encouraged by my colleague, Ms. Moore, pointing out that the, the caseworkers for the federal offices, the federally funded offices, are uh, state-operated, in most cases at the county level, offices that uh, pro provide uh, the government's delivery system for most of these uh, safety net benefits uh, aren't actually caseworkers. They administer programs. Uh, I found this out when I was in business and I got involved in the uh, Workforce Policy Board. Um, you know, we owe a dollars now instead of, uh, you know, rebranded, but same challenges. And one of the social workers said, you know, I got into this because I really want to help people. But what I find is I can just administer programs. And sometimes they don't really work very well. And you know, you think of kind of props to the fact that this is inadequately structured, you know, perhaps intentionally inadequately structured. Um, and, and even if it wasn't, why do we keep letting it happen? Year in, year out, we do it. And thankfully, there are groups like Catholic Social Services that come in and frankly, help uh, translate that giant blob of stuff over there in some communities and the Urban League and others and uh, Salvation Army, so many other good nonprofits that the trillion dollars that we dispense uh, as a country uh, is even greater because private charity overwhelmingly funds these causes. Um, and, and, and it just highlights, why do we keep tolerating the brokenness? Why? And, and so, you know, when I came to Congress, one of the bills that I wanted to move is, is uh, what I've called the Person-Centered Assistance Reform Act. People care uh, when you put it in the plural. So what the goal is, is that we get four Republicans and four Democrats. They get a year and a half to work together, and they can't do what either side considers is evil, you know, which is cut spending, 
or launch new spending, new programs. But you could just make it work better. Now, that takes all the guard, puts the guardrails in, but you could do things like, I, I would like to think that at a minimum, you could eliminate benefit cliffs. And I'm just going down the line real quick. Are, benefits, are benefit cliffs a feature or a flaw of the current system? I can't answer that one of Senate word. So, I, like, benefit cliffs are pretty complicated. They relate to how quickly Are they benefits. good or bad? All things being equal, you would love for benefits to phase out more slowly than not. But, All right, cliffs are but, bad. All right, I'm just going no, to waste excuse time. Excuse me, that is it's not what I said. I don't want that reflected. my time. I do not have, I got a little bit of time. I got 20 seconds. Benefit cliffs are bad. Let's end them. That's why you get a year and a half, you'd spend an hour and a half talking about this every day on the most basic thing. Benefit cliffs are bad. I hope we end them. I hope we can find a way to work together and spend time doing stuff that's productive. Uh, just yes or no. Benefit cliffs are bad. The most important thing we could do I is yield. ensure universal health coverage. Um, the gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Arrington is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, witnesses, for your, uh, for your feedback. Um, I think all Americans, whether you're from West Texas or the Northeast and anywhere throughout the continental United States, people want to help people if they are working hard and they still can't make ends meet or if they are just physically unable to help themselves. I, I haven't met anyone, Republican or Democrat, and I'm in a very conservative part of the country, but, um, but my fellow West Texans love their fellow Americans. They love their neighbors, and they believe that they have a moral responsibility to, to help those neighbors in need. And, um, but the question always comes down to not what is the goal, but how that goal is achieved, by what means and what policies. And that's where we have such vast disagreements because of the uh, adverse and unintended consequences of policies. And, and it doesn't really matter in the final analysis what someone's intentions are if it leaves us in a worse condition than before we implemented those policies. Um, tell me, Ms. Reynolds, um, quantify for me the importance of work for all Americans who are able to work. Mm -hmm. right. uh, Self-worth, economic implications of it, quality of life. Why do we need, and, and I bring this up because my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are talking about a tax, a refundable tax credit whereby um, people would get cash assistance. That's what a refundable tax credit is, especially if you have no tax liability. Most of these folks have no, they don't, they aren't paying taxes. They get cash. And in the provision that was in the Bill Back Better for, on the House side, it was upwards of 3,000 per child, mm -hmm. and they, they pulled the requirement of working when you're an able-bodied adult. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how we could disagree on that, and I, I, I'm trying to be open to, to many of my colleagues' suggestions on how to end poverty. By the way, just a side note, I also can't believe we've spent trillions of dollars as a nation in starting in the 60s uh, when we had this burgeoning welfare, uh, welfare programs to, to, to fight the war against poverty only after trillions of dollars to end up with relatively the same poverty rate today. Mm -hmm. So just please, Ms. Reynolds, talk about the dignity, the importance, the, yeah. and the many manifold blessings and benefits of incentivizing people to work when they can. Right. I mean, I think, you know, we, most of us would agree that work produces an incredible amount of dignity for uh, all of us. I would specifically, you know, it brings to mind um, a client we worked with at Catholic Charities Fort Worth. Her name was Perla. Perla came through our doors, unable to make ends meet. 
Um, we helped her in that current situation of what she was dealing with, but then we wanted to work with her to put her on a journey out of poverty. And Perla's dreams was so beautiful. Her dream was a black suit, and the reason her dream was a black suit is because at the end of the night, she wanted to be sitting at the table with her husband and son, proud of going to work and what she had accomplished that day. Um, but the journey to get to that black suit for Perla wasn't as easy as, you know, go work, Perla. Um, we got her three jobs at Catholic Charities. Um, it was finally the third one that stuck, and the reason it took three tries is because Perla would place her son in a child care arrangement, and she would just cry because she didn't feel like he was safe. And so I think it's important to remember, and I think our evidence with programs we're building evidence show at Leo, yes, work has dignity. Yes, work is a critical move to earnings and income and um, a move out of self-sufficiency, but it's also so important that we comprehensively support somebody yes. so we can get them. And I, I would rather not a nameless, faceless bureaucrat from some distant program in Washington but someone at a charity like the Catholic Charities to actually engage and, and to understand some of the underlying challenges that, that our fellow Americans have that are the root causes sometimes of their being trapped in poverty. That, that's why I don't, I don't think we're looking at the right end of the continuum of care. I think the more local, the more connected, the more you can minister to the deeper needs while you're providing the practical needs. Anyway, I've gone over my time. Thank you all for, for your input and insights, and thanks for your answer. Gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. Jacobs is recognized for five minutes. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and thank you uh, to all the witnesses for being here. Um, I, I know the, the chairman asked uh, about fragmentation and our current social safety net. You know, millions of people benefit from that social safety net each year, but as you all have testified, there are some real gaps in it. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask, um, Ms. Parrott, if you were to reimagine the U.S. social benefit system from the ground up, what would it look like? Thanks for that question. You know, first and foremost, I think if you were really starting all over again, you'd make sure that people had, um, that, that we had a, a system where people had enough income, that they had enough cash assistance, had enough cash income to supplement their low wages when they're able to work um, and to fill in when they aren't able to work. Um, and that, that income support piece of our current safety net is often inadequate. But the reality today is that we have many effective programs that are delivering important help to people who need it, as you've said, and there are gaps. And so I'm a little bit of a pragmatist, which says, like, how can we take our current system and move it to the next level so it does more to help people? Um, and I think that there are a number of things that we can do. One relates to how we help people access it in a simpler way, and the other relates to the gaps that are holding people back. So when we underfund childcare, then a couple of things happen, right? Not enough people get help, and the benefit cliffs that people get so upset about, um, and that the gentleman wanted me to have a one word answer to, which just isn't possible in a complicated issue, but we have benefit cliffs in childcare because we underfund the system, and so we have hard eligibility limits because there just isn't enough resources to go around. So I am all for having benefits more slowly phased down as people as people's incomes go up, but that costs more, not less. Mr. Gupta, same question to you. Thank you, Representative Jacobs. I think one of the lessons learned from the last uh, half century or so is that when we give too much authority and flexibility and responsibility to states, we have widespread racial disparities that uh, we uh, have to really um, take stock of and ask ourselves if that's the right approach. Some of the most effective programs in our system of social protection are federally run or federally led and with strong federal guardrails. And I do wanna note the $1 trillion figure we keep hearing about is dominated by Medicaid. And Medicaid, by the way, is far more efficient than private health coverage. So if the alternative was private health coverage, Medicaid is probably doing a better job, not just in containing costs, but otherwise. And finally, if I could just note a great example, the child tax credit, federally administered program, it has returns about eight to one. So if I told you you could have a risk-free investment with eight to one returns because it was fully refundable going to the very poorest kids, I would hope that we would all say yes. And we should value work, but we also have to value care. And people are, people are, 
providing tens of billions of dollars of unpaid caregiving in their families, and we need to start valuing that. Totally agree, and I'll just note that there are also many studies that say the expanded child tax credit actually did not reduce uh, employment either. Um, I want to talk about something that I know we've, we've talked a lot about, which is how we make sure that people are benefiting from the programs that already exist that they are eligible for. And I, I actually think that there is bipartisan support for figuring out how we do this. Um, Mr. Gupta, in your testimony, you noted that the administrative burden of navigating the benefit system not only costs individuals in terms of time and the time tax, um, but it also leads to the misuse or uh, you know, ineffective use of public resources. And I, I know we all want to use our public resources uh, more effectively. So can you expand on how administrative burden both creates costs for individuals and government administrative costs and how we in Congress can work to modernize or streamline benefits uh, to address those inefficiencies? Uh, definition of deservedness, and they require participants, applicants, people who uh, often are turned away, to go through lots of hoops. They require enormous administrative resources, even small things like checking for uh, asset limits or um, asking people to document their income in general um, on such an ongoing basis can bump people off of benefits when they're trying to advance, when they're trying to do the right thing. So we need to look really hard. The administration has taken the lead with an executive order around this, but there's a lot Congress can do also to reduce administrative burdens, and it will be an efficiency gain overall for our system. Well, thank you. And I think uh, maybe we'd love to get, uh, for the record, some specific ideas on how we in Congress could reduce administrative burden, as I do think that we on this committee have some bipartisan support to try and do that. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady Yields, Ms. Bice, who is joining us remotely, is recognized for five minutes. Ms. Bice, you're not coming through. That's either because you're muted or we have a technical glitch. My apologies. There we go. Mr. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Ranking Member Style and certainly to our witnesses who are participating uh, in this hearing today. I want to first start by saying, um, as a fellow Catholic, I am very familiar with the incredible work that Catholic Charities does for communities across the country. Um, so thank you, Ms. Reynolds, for advocating for those. Today's hearing comes actually at a difficult time, though, as American people are being pinched by rising prices, higher interest rates, um, and slowing economic growth. The social safety nets are there for workers who are going through tough times. However, a strong growing economy does much more for workers than government run programs could ever provide. Um, you know, those that are working um, are being able to drive a sense of purpose and satisfaction from their labor that government assistance can't replace. Um, and to that point, I want to talk about the fact that we've heard some really um, troubling news this morning on economic growth that has slowed for the second straight quarter providing negative GDP. Interest rates uh, were, risen, were increased by 75 basis points yesterday, and the administration really isn't altering course to try to um, enact policies to, to exacerbate the economic ills that we have. So, Ms. Reynolds, I want to start by asking you, can you discuss how a constricting economy and rising interest rates can impact Americans who are already living on the edge and do these economic conditions make it more difficult for families who are in poverty to, bat, to bounce back? Uh, thank you so much for your question. I think absolutely, and I think a lot of the research we have done at Notre Dame would further emphasize that. Um, specifically, what I would note is that, you know, you can use a recession in this time to really invest in things for low-income Americans while making sure their basic needs are met that would produce results so that they can be on a pathway out of poverty, a pathway of upward mobility for the long haul. So it's important to think about today, but it's also important to think about what we can be doing. What does the evidence tell us today works to get someone not food secure, but to get someone long-term on that path out of poverty. Let's invest in those solutions. And where we don't have the evidence, let's build that evidence along the way. So a decade from now, when we hopefully aren't in a recession, but maybe might be again, we aren't scratching our heads wondering what should we do. 
Well, and I, I think to add to that, um, we we talk about programs like Catholic Charities and others across the country that are providing sort of resources. I would argue um, that. Uh, these private entities, whether it be uh, religious-based or otherwise, do it better. Uh, Government-run programs don't tend to be the most efficient. I also want to maybe comment on something that was brought up earlier about the uh, most recent, the American Rescue Plan and the funding that was presented. You know, I do believe uh, that this is one of the reasons that we're seeing inflation uh, reach high levels, uh, you know, 40-year highs. The, the first two packages that were put together to address COVID, I think, would have been enough. The third one is, I believe, what really pushed us over the edge. Um, so looking at it from a spending perspective, we have to be really mindful about what we're doing because it c- can come back to haunt us. Um, I have, uh, I'm proud that my home state of Oklahoma uh, has established community hope centers which provide uh, families and children with much needed resources while focusing on empowering them to return to self-sufficiency. The model has shown great promise. Uh, Ms. Reynolds, could you share your perspective on how the federal government could modify uh, welfare programs to focus on providing that assistance without making individuals what I consider to be perpetually dependent um, on government support? You know, I think it is really important to remember in each of these programs, we need to have a clear understanding of what we want the end goal to be. Um, A great example of the benefit of emergency financial assistance can be seen in one of the studies we ran um, at LEO with Catholic Charities Chicago, where we studied their homeless prevention call center with and asked the question, if somebody gets assistance, will it reduce their chances of being evicted? And the long, the short answer of it was yes, 70% less likely to be evicted, therefore providing more housing stability. The goal of that program was to provide housing stability, at least for a 12-month period of time. The goal of that program was not upward mobility. If we want the goal of upward mobility to be the goal, then programs need to look different. They need to be backed by evidence that work with families, all in unique circumstances, all with unique variables in their lives, and a comprehensive solution provided for them, again, that is backed in the evidence that tells us what works. Thank you. And my time has expired, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. Ms. Kamek, who is joining us remotely, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Working Member Style for hosting this hearing here today. Thank you also to our witnesses for before, uh, appearing before the committee. And I do hope we get a second round because um, there is no shortage of uh, discussion to have on this. So uh, for me personally, if I had to sum it up, I would love to see government work themselves out of business when it comes to so many of these issues. But um, you know, I think we'll just get right into the heart of it. You know, right now our country is entering a completely avoidable recession. Again, this recession was completely avoidable. It was not inevitable, as some of my colleagues across the aisle in this administration would want Americans to believe. Um, but at least they're done gaslighting Americans who believe that uh, that we're not in a recession. I think the numbers speak volumes um, that came out today about a second quarter of consecutive uh, downturn. But, you know, you look at last year, the nation was getting back to normal. Americans were getting back to work. uh, But folks on the other side of the aisle just couldn't let well enough alone and instead jammed through a massive partisan spending package in the name of COVID relief. It was a flimsy excuse for what was really a grab bag of big government spending that swamped our nation's recovering economy. Now, this package passed on strictly partisan lines, of course, with Democrats using budget reconciliation to bypass the 60 vote threshold necessary to get this monstrosity of a package through the Senate. The majority in the administration might pretend that they were caught flat footed by the consequences of what they did here. And they can blame it on Russia or China or Trump or the supply chain, but they knew what they were doing and they were warned. We were all warned by what the results could potentially be by pulling the ripcord on government spending at this size. Even former Obama administration officials warned of the economic consequences of injecting trillions of dollars into the economy. Nonetheless, Democrats moved forward with the proposal and Democrats passed 
ironically named uh, the $1.9 trillion uh, American Rescue Plan Act. Now, ordinary Americans are now reaping what the Democrats have sowed last year with sky high prices, historic inflation, and an economy on the downslide. So where exactly did that $1.9 trillion go? Here's what we know. It flooded the state and local governments with $350 billion with a B, uh, leaving serious oversight concerns on how this money is being spent, where it's going, and what is the accountability on this. And enhanced unemployment benefits to keep Americans dependent and discourage people from returning to work. I know this from speaking to hundreds of employers, not just in my district, but across the state of Florida and the country. It also included a union boss backed $570 million giveaway to keep teachers at home, schools closed, and abandoning America's children. And how much of that money actually went to COVID relief? 9%. 9%. While simultaneously garnishing the wages of my generation, my children, and my grandchildren. Now, at the time of passage, the federal government had an estimated $1 trillion already available to the administration for COVID relief. Now, did anyone make any effort to repurpose money that was already on the table? No, absolutely not. Of course not. Why get in the way of a raft of ruinous new spending? All in all, that one bill added $14,000 per household to our national debt a national debt, which by the way, is unsustainable. Now, fast forward to just months after passage of the American Rescue Plan and everything that has been warned about has now happened. The inflation has rate has steadily gone up. We've all seen the memes. It's not really funny when you are on a fixed income and you're trying to figure out if you're going to buy gas or groceries. Now, with the announcement today that we are in fact in a recession, and there is no debating that, regardless of how the majority, the administration, or their lackeys in the media will attempt to gaslight and confuse Americans into believing otherwise, people in the real world, we know what's up. But instead of waking up to the sobering realities of inflation, economic stagnation, and the costs that are squeezing everyday Americans at the pump, the store, and everywhere else, Democrats have doubled down on their tax and spend agenda and have brought back the Build Back Broke bill it's back from the dead. So on any given day, I'll pace, place my bets on the ability of the individual to really make the best decisions rather than be burdened with more government spending that is unsustainable. And I know my time has expired, but Mr. Chairman, I hope we get a second round because there are a lot of questions that I have for the witnesses here today, but I felt it important to make the statement that more spending and making more Americans dependent on big government is not empowering. We need to get back to the basics and unleash American prosperity. With that, I yield back. Run, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. Or I can just keep going. The, the, <laughs> gentle lady, the gentle lady has yielded back. Sorry, I was just negotiating with a ranking member. We're going to have floor votes very soon, and I, but I know that there are uh, members with a number of follow-up questions. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to seek unanimous consent to recognize for a second round members who are either present on screen right now or who appear on screen or present in the next five minutes or so, yep. just to be fair to people who, uh, who might not be tuned in. That will probably lead to another uh, 25 or so minutes of, uh, of questioning. So uh, seeking unanimous consent, uh, so be it. Um, uh, let me, I'm, I'm going to actually pass for the moment and go then to uh, Ms. Captor uh, for five minutes. And I am going to be strict on the time, so, so let's keep it to five minutes, folks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask unanimous consent to place in the record two studies that were done by the GAO on the transiency of students across this country uh, in some of the lowest income precincts in the, in the census tracts in the nation. It is endemic in many of uh, our communities, and I believe education is a ladder to success. And when that is interrupted uh, consistently um, without any solution, and this happens for decades, uh, we have many uh, individuals who fall behind. Uh, so I would ask uh, unanimous consent to place these two GAO studies documenting this movement of young people across uh, our country and from school to school to school in their home communities and by the third grade we lose them. May I have unanimous consent to place that in the record. 
Uh, seeking unanimous consent, so ordered. Thank you very much. I wanted to ask any witness that wishes to, to comment, and thank you for the important work you do, and uh, the people who you represent in coming before us today. Uh, drug uh, overdoses in our country, and the problem of drug trafficking, how do you see that impacting the prospects for the individuals uh, that you champion? Do you see it creating greater obstacles? Do you think it's um, uniform across income groups? Or do you see those who are uh, in the lower quartile of the economic spectrum being more impacted, and if so, how? I mean, I can start. Um, it's um, it's an area that I have some, but not a lot of expertise in. Certainly, there's no question um, that substance use disorders um, are incredibly just destabilizing for families, um, and that the and that the, here again, there's some good news that there's actually been progress around uh, medication treatment, and a uh, that that is very evidence based and is having great success when it is deployed. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is the way that Medicaid can actually facilitate Medicaid, uh, th this evidence-based, medication-based uh, substance use disorder treatment. Um, and one of the things that's happened in states that have taken and adopted the Medicaid expansion is that Medicaid has played an incredibly important role in their, in their opioid response. And one of the things that's happening in states that have refused to adopt the expansion is they don't have that tool in their toolbox. Um, so it is an example where we've had we've had some in, some real evidence developed of of more successful ways to do this, and Medicaid actually can play and is playing a really important role in many communities. But Ms. Parrott, are you aware that in many states, when an individual is incarcerated uh, and they have um, substance abuse disorders, that medication is taken away from them? Again, that's not an area of my expertise, but that is a but that is obviously counterproductive. Mm -hmm. For the mentally I, ill, it's devastating. Um, I would definitely say that you know substance abuse is something that um, when we're dealing with what works to help people on a path of upward mobility needs to be something that is considered. Um, Leo uh, co-founder Bill Evans did a, a wonderful paper, and, and I can share it with you, on the opioid crisis and what families, not just um, the person um, who has the addiction, but what happens to the impact of families, I think is a really important insight and consideration. Um, I'd also say, you know, there's a partner we're talking to in Texas who is running all through the North Texas region um, opioid response uh, teams, crisis teams, to really get out there and help make change. And I think there's a lot more evidence that needs to be built in this space to understand the best responses. I'll just say that grandparents raising grandchildren now has Huge. become a major Huge. challenge uh, for the region that I represent. And I doubt that we're the only region that's experiencing this. I'll just add this. Uh, prior to COVID-19, uh, the opioid crisis was the number one public health emergency uh, in the nation. Uh, I, I'm not clear now, uh, in the wake of the opioid crisis, whether well, in the wake of the, the abatement a bit of, uh, of COVID-19, whether the opioid crisis uh, is still as severe in communities uh, as it may have been. But there is no doubt, and like so many things, it was presented as though it was a problem of only white rural Americans, when in fact it has become a problem of Americans across the board. Uh, and therefore, I think uh, it bears attention from this Congress. And I think Ms. Parrott indicated why uh, expansion of Medicaid, why providing support. You can't fight this on your own. The, the last thing I'll say yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Morial. I'll have to be strict on the second round. So uh, the gentlelady's time has expired. Um, I, the unanimous consent order was that any member present or appearing in this five-minute period would be recognized. So I've got Mr. Donalds, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, Ms. Moore, and uh, myself. Uh, and with that, I will recognize the ranking member for five minutes. I made the list. I, I, I want to go back to you, uh, Ms. Reynolds, if I can. Um, I, I got back up the charges because I think it's so powerful to get an understanding of how complex this system is. We've had a lot of discussion about how work plays a role. 
One of the things I think that's really important is when we look at wealth transfers, it can alleviate the math problem, uh, but it doesn't make it a sustainable leap into the middle class, which I think is ultimately really a lot of our goals. Um, and you see the myriad of, of programs that are engaged in this. And, and I wanna be clear on this because there were, there's some crosstalk on this point. The incentive structure can alter the total percentage of labor participation. That, that doesn't mean people are lazy. It doesn't mean people don't wanna work. It just means to me simply that if we are providing people with a certain level of funds that you can alter the broader incentive structure to work. Um, and so what we wanna do is we, we know people want to be self-sustainable, people want to move up, people want to be able to lift themselves up. And sometimes that requires assistance to get there. It doesn't mean that you get to always do it by yourself, right? We wanna make sure that there is a safety net so when people fall on hard times, they can come back into and out of poverty come out of poverty and then ultimately into the middle class in a self-sustainable way. But I want, if I can, Ms. Reynolds, for you to just kind of walk us through kind of your experience in either the macro level data or the micro level, the story of an individual, how work played such a critical role. Because during this previous pandemic, we saw a lot of our key uh, social safety net programs be gutted uh, and disconnected from work, uh, often with, coupled with increase in payments, what was the real world implications of that either at the macro or the micro level? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the best, um, one, one of the best examples of a program we at Leo have built evidence around is the Goodwill um, Excel Center model. Uh, what I love about this model is it works specifically in states that allow um, adults um, past their high school year to get a high school diploma. There's many states where that's not allowed. And what these Goodwill Excel Centers do is they offer an opportunity for a client to come into the program to get their high school degree, to get post-secondary credentialing, all while surrounding them with childcare supports if that's what's needed, food if that's what's needed, a flexible work schedule if that's what's needed. A lot of those folks are working and going to school at the same time, but their goal is to not just have a job for their lives, but to have a career for their lives. And so students go into the Goodwill uh, Excel Center and then they come out, many of them going into the formal sector, most of them increasing their wages, earnings, job placement, those sorts of things. Those are the kind of solutions we need to be investing in the United States. If you look at the state of Arizona, they recently, um, through some testifying and work of the Goodwill Excel Center said, yep, we're gonna change policy and we're gonna invest in this because the evidence shows this comprehensive approach works to move people to outcomes of earnings and employment and a life of dignity. And so more investment in programs like that where a Goodwill Excel Center client walks through the door and they're able to not see that mess of a maze, but instead see something that really meets them where they're at. And those workers help them on that pathway out of poverty. I, I appreciate that. I think there's such an opportunity here to get away from bureaucratic morass and truly help individuals uh, so that they can lift themselves up. I think it's just a really key component. Uh, only so we get through the second round, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Ranking member yields back. Ms. Ocasio-Cortez joining us remotely is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, for, for hosting this important hearing. I really want to focus on one of the most effective economic security programs that we've seen implemented in, you know, over the last year, one to two years, uh, which is the child tax credit. Um, a lot of this is really structured as almost a universal basic income for children. And it was arguably one of the largest such experiments in American history, de delving and starting get, getting into the space of a universal income. We talk a lot about how much it reduced poverty and the child tax credit absolutely did. It cut childhood poverty by roughly 30%. And then when it expired in January, nearly 4 million children went back into poverty with the highest increase being in black and Latino communities. But I also wanna dig into a little bit of the material impact beyond poverty, because as we've scheduled, as we've discussed before in this, Measurement of poverty can be um, something that escapes us, but also multidimensional. 
So Mr. Dutta Gupta, a Brookings Institute study of the child tax credit found that families who received the CTC experienced declines in their credit card debt. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And they also had reduced reliance on high cost financial services such as payday loans, pawn shops, and even reduced rates of selling blood plasma. Is that also correct? That's absolutely correct. And in the U.S., blood plasma is a major survival strategy for some of the lowest income families. And we also saw that they were better able to manage emergency expenses. They strengthened their rainy day funds. Parents were able to pay for tutors for their children, spend more time with them, which, as we know, from an educational and socio-emotional development point of view, is very crucial. Um, and they were also able to purchase more and nutritious food for their families, correct? That's right. And giving money to parents with the least income ensures much higher quality parental interactions and investments, just as you've highlighted. And it also in the structure of this, the fact that it wasn't just one lump sum at the end of the year, but that it was a recurring source of income for families in, you know, that, that were experiencing the hardship that we all did during COVID. Um, but it, it was that monthly disbursement. Um, would you say that that the, that structuring that structuring it that way was also providing immediate benefits and help to these families? That's right, Representative Ocasio-Cortez. Families budget on a monthly basis, and you can see the effects uh, of the monthly payments really helping families meet basic needs, even preventing evictions. So I also want to dig into this other side of uh, the argument, which goes into work requirements for programs like the CTC. Um, you know, there were some arguments that some of these economic security programs would disincentivize parents from working and negatively impact workforce participation. But what we also saw from Brookings was that there was no statistically significant changes in employment between CTC eligible households and those without qualifying children. We also saw from the Washington University in St. Louis that there was also no evidence that CTC payments led parents to leave the workforce. Um, we saw no significant difference in employment rates between low-income, middle-income, or high-income families receiving C CTC. And we found that nearly 94% of parents said that they plan to continue working or even work more once upon receiving this credit. So, uh, Mr. Dr. Gupta, do you, would you agree that the CTC, the child tax credit, did not reduce employment or disincentivize parents looking for work? Overall, that's absolutely correct. Remember, the child tax credit can also help parents afford care that they need to work, afford transportation, and other work-related expenses. Uh, so there has been not a single study that has shown that the child tax credit, as enhanced by the American Rescue Plan, reduced employment. It, in fact, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities study also found employment increases among cash assistance recipients subject to these work requ requirements were modest, but they also faded over time. And most cash assistance recipients subject to those work requirements actually stayed poor, and some even became poorer. Uh, Ms. Parrott, would you generally agree with this report by your organization that work requirements do little to reduce poverty and, in fact, can push families even deeper into poverty? And if so, how? Yeah, thank you for that. Yes, um, taking away benefits that people need to survive if a, if a parent isn't able or can't meet a work requirement is uh, very counterproductive. It makes the family destabilized. It makes it harder for that parent to move forward. And most importantly, it puts their child at deep risk for deep poverty that has long-lasting negative effects. Thank you. The uh, gentlelady's time has uh, expired just for the benefit of members. There are four votes on the floor right now. However, the timing is such that we're going to easily get through uh, Mr. Donalds and Ms. Moore. With that, Mr. Donalds, five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I actually like this committee. I really do. Um, we actually have really good conversations in this committee. I think um, so. in some respects, you know, even when it was formed, I was kind of like, huh? I'm actually glad it was. We actually get to delve into these topics not so much from a uh, standing committee focus, but from a multi-committee focus with different uh, parts of public policy. I think it makes for a bar discussion. Um, real quick, um, Mr. Morial and uh, and Ms. Reynolds, I'm gonna go to you first, Mr. Morial. Can you like kind of expand upon like some of the drivers that you've seen 
uh, from gen- for, that cause generational poverty? Like, from your experience, what have you seen that are like the drivers of that? I mean, one of the drivers of uh, generational poverty is simply that parents, mothers, people raising children cannot adequately provide for their kids. Uh, they uh, can't afford rent. Uh, they get bounced around from apartment to apartment, from neighborhood to neighborhood. Uh, they have a difficult time uh, uh, making it, and then the child becomes a low performer in school. Uh, and as a low performer in school, they don't have the opportunity uh, to finish high school and then go on to post-secondary success. So uh, the issue with things like the child tax credit, you do for mothers, you do for children, you do for families, you do for children. The key is to provide the supports for families so that they can adequately provide for their children what every parent wants to provide for their children, a safe, wholesome place to live, uh, a, a, a house with food, uh, an educational opportunities, after school opportunities, extracurricular acti- uh, opportunities. So a lot of it is rooted in the experience children have coming up. And if the parents don't have the support, if the home environment and uh, whether they're being raised by two parents, one parent, a grandparent, and a mother, uh, which uh, is, 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 is common nowadays. Uh, it is the support that they have. Ultimately, the way to buck intergenerational poverty is through educational attainment. Okay. Uh, for the kids. Somebody, somebody was playing your greatest hits. They liked your answer. They had to play that back. <laughs> uh, Ms. Reynolds, I don't know if you want to comment on that or expand on it or maybe you have a different viewpoint. Yeah, I think, no, I really appreciate what my fellow witness shared. And, you know, in the opening uh, videos that we watched, both the two uh, women, Angela and Elizabeth, I, I noted that both of them talked about, um, you know, I didn't have parents or I didn't have a support system or no one was there to teach me how to interview. And I think that's really important to not underestimate um, how important family is. Um, I think there's a couple studies that are really worth pointing to regarding intergenerational poverty. One is um, economist at Notre Dame, Chloe Gibbs, did a wonderful study on the impact of early education, both if you look at a two-generational support to the parent and to the child. Um, another um, one that is um, that has been conducted is with an organization called Friends of the Children. Um, they're a national organization that has run a randomized controlled trial looking at when you give children um, that mentor and that support, what really happens to their performance and their achievement later in life. Um, since then, they want to take that to a deeper level and understand kind of what happens when you help, you know, parent or mom and child at the same time to lift everybody up. And Leo has the privilege of conducting that study. So I think more and more we're understanding that um, how um, important it is to address not just children, not just families, but both. Okay. Uh, Look, I I will tell you that, you know, even in both of your comments, um, my my perspective, not even my perspective, my, I guess my life, just me, you know, growing up in in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I mean, my mom was a she's a tough one, man. She's rough, and you know, I talk about her often. But I think that the, you know the difference that occurred in my life is that she never accepted no or circumstances as the reason, and so that was a driver for me. And I know that every child's experiences are different, um, but I agree, Mr. Murray. I, I really agree with your point that you know academic attainment. Is, is that is like probably the number one driver for breaking for breaking that that cycle you know because a child being able to to acquire the necessary skill set to move up the economic ladder changes the trajectory of that entire family going forward um, I, th- I think that you know as a body and, and maybe this might be a topic for future discussion we should start really thinking about some areas of academic attainment that also don't follow just going to four-year university. No disrespect to everybody that went there. I went myself. Um, but there's so many other pathways to be able to earn a substantial living without taking on the additional costs of college, edu- of college education. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen, time has expired. Ms. Moore is recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. And I enjoy this committee too, Mr. Donnell. And I was... I have some questions and I was hoping that you wouldn't run off because I know it's right in your wheelhouse. I want to talk about uh, housing for a second um, because that's also part of the social safety net um, that we discuss. Um, I 
want to know, maybe Mr. Morial uh, can, can address this. Um, you, we all have talked about how the, the, we've had flat wages for 40 years. Uh, we haven't uh, raised the minimum wage for 13 years, $7.25 an hour. And yet, housing costs around the world have gone up. There was a study done of 218 cities around the world, and the top 10 cities that had become unaffordable were, guess where, in the United States of America. And so I'm, I'm asking you all, to what extent do you think the lack of affordable housing uh, contributes to uh, poverty indicators? Let's go ask the people living in tents in cities across America. The people living in tents today don't look like the homeless of the 80s. They're young white families. They're black people. They're veterans. They're immigrants. They're living in tents not only in Washington, D.C., in New Orleans, San Francisco. They're living under bridges. Go ask them why they're there. They're there because they cannot afford to pay rent. Your own community, there's an incredible book, and you should invite this gentleman to testify, Chairman Hines, Matt Desmond. Oh, my God. So it's an wrote embarrassing the book. Evicted, book. Who talked about uh, uh, Ms. Kaptur, Mr. Style, Mr. Donald, uh, the rise in average rents and the percentage of Americans who are paying 50% of their earnings in rent. This is a radical shift from the way things were in the year 2000. So when you have depressed wages, an increase in rents, those are, that's a basic human need, then the remainder of the money that you are bringing in goes to what food, I want to make a point, because this point has been, when we talk about poverty in America, we're not talking about just unemployed people. Mm -hmm. We're talking about working Americans. Some of the people that work in this building, that work in the cafeteria, who clean up, who work every day, make limited wages, but have to pay for housing in Washington, D.C., have to pay for transportation in Washington, D.C., and in the DMV. And thank, thank you so much for that, Mr. Murrow. That was comprehensive. Maybe I'll ask Mr. Um, uh, Gouda, Gupta sort of the same question. Um, we've heard a lot about the quote unquote dignity of work. Uh, $7.25 an hour. You know, you need maybe two, three of those jobs <laughs> in order to be able to bring home enough money. I mean, my daughter worked at a, a shelter once that people were going to work and quote, coming home to the shelter and to their children. So I'm asking you, um, when we talk about the dignity of work, is there any dignity in working for $7.25 an hour and being, un being unhoused, being unable to, uh, you know, getting evicted, you know, because you can't keep the utilities on, um, uh, or you're working two, three of these jobs. When do, when do you clean your house? When do you parent? Tell me about this dignity of work that we hear about a lot. Thank you, Representative Moore. And, and it's even worse for some workers. We have a tip minimum wage of $2.13 an hour since the early 1980s. It's supposed to be made up with tips, but frequently isn't. Uh, and we have a lot of exclusions, including for workers with disabilities uh, and younger workers from the basic minimum wage floor. Uh, we have now gone through the longest stretch uh, in, in US history of not raising the minimum wage since we established the minimum wage. And uh, of course, uh, when you combine that with the cost of housing, which has risen far faster before the ARP, before the pandemic, um, but will continue to rise. Uh, the combination makes uh, no sense for many workers who also may need to afford childcare. Um, so we absolutely need to take steps to raise the minimum wage. And I do want to emphasize that our large share of, low of jobs being low wage in the United States is a policy choice. We can choose to have a higher wage workforce and other peer Wealthy nations have okay, chosen. Excuse that. me. Thank you for that. I need my next right. five seconds. Um, I want to ask a unanimous consent to put in the record an article from the New York Times uh, of May 2nd, 2022, which documents um, the, uh, the, uh, the lack of wages 
of the increase in housing costs such uh, that the United States is, has the, the highest, the 10 highest uh, rates of uh, unaffordability. And I just wanted to say to you, Ms. Reynolds, I am so parola. I can remember trying to apply for a job and calling my sister up and she mailed me a black suit to interview in. Oh. And let me just tell you, I, I had a second interview and she mailed me another suit and said, you better get that job. Said, <laughs> I, I love that you're wearing that black suit today. I swear, I'm just a little bit bigger. Uh, uh, with, without objection, so ordered. The gentlelady's time has expired. We are almost out of time. I uh, theoretically have five minutes, but I, I, I want to actually ambush you. I'm, I'm delighted by the comedy that you're seeing up here. Um, it is essential to me as chairman that we come up with ideas that stand some chance of becoming law. Uh, as long as the filibuster exists, that means that those ideas will attract some bipartisan support. So I don't really have five minutes left, but I, what I want to do is put you all on the spot, speed round, please no more than 30 seconds each, two, two, two parameters. One, big impact on our social safety net, positive impact. Number two, stand some chance of becoming law. I'm just going to go right down the line. Uh, I understand that there's different levels of sophistication with respect to bipartisanship and the way this place works, but 30 seconds each, please. Uh, what's the one thing you would urge us to do that stands some chance of becoming law in the near term? Ms. Ms. Parrott. So I think there's a long history of bipartisanship around refundable tax credits, and I think that there is a pathway there. I also just want to say that I think around uh, easing access to benefits. I think we've seen here a lot of bipartisanship. And the last thing I'll say is I think that there is broad bipartisanship around both housing and childcare as really critical issues that face families. And there's a history, at least on the appropriation side of, of uh, bipartisanship there, and both of them support working families. Thank you very much. Mr. Moore. I'm just going to say uh, uh, amen to what you said. I think the idea that the tax code has been used uh, uh, as a bipartisan tool to address poverty with the earned income tax credit, then the child tax credit is really a, a, an idea that was birthed in bipartisan conversations years ago. It's an old idea. It's not a new idea. It just finally got enacted. Uh, and, and then I think, secondly, I do think there's something to be said about ease of access to programs. Now, that's a, thick, that's a sticky wiki because it involves state governments and local governments and community-based organizations and different federal agencies. But but, but it's worth a sleeves rolled up effort uh, to make what we have today more accessible to people. But I think uh, using the tax code, if we could think about that as a tool uh, to further address poverty, EITC, CTC, I think maybe uh, it stands some chance. But uh, I'll leave that to you. Thank you, Mr. Mario. That's great. We're hearing a co common theme here. Ms. Evermore? Um, I think uh, fully funding the president's budget request for UI administration is key. Um, I just spoke to this week uh, the Connecticut Department of Labor um, uh, Commissioner and the UI Director, and they in Connecticut are struggling to, uh, to move through their backlog from the pandemic, and they still have substantial appeals backlogs. And if a state like Connecticut is struggling, I can guarantee you that every state is struggling. Um, the other thing I'd say is consider uh, the, the uh, broad UI reform principles in the president's budget, including adequate benefits in every state, uh, scalable benefits to, automatic, to, to, to economic downturns, and uh, changes that reflect the modern workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Evermore. Mr. Gupta. Thank you. I would uh, strongly recommend the House consider the Bipartisan Savings Penalty Elimination Act. Uh, which would raise SSI asset limits, which have been uh, frozen for decades at $2,000 for singles, $3,000 for married folks. Uh, I think we can uh, get that done. And uh, think about a national subsidized jobs program, which has garnered bipartisan support in the past, uh, especially one that might target youth, help us uh, employ people to address the climate crisis. It's a win-win-win for employers, taxpayers, and for the workers alike, and we can provide that research to Help you all move forward on it. Thank you very much, Mr. Dodegupta. Ms. Reynolds. There are case management programs that have causal evidence behind them that they work for upward mobility. Number one, invest in those. Number two, there are eight 
RC randomized control trial backed solutions, ASAP, one million degrees, stay the course, that show that they can get people across the community, uh, completion, community college completion line. Let's invest in those. Let's move resources to invest in things that work with the goal of upward mobility for those families. Thank you very much, Ms. Reynolds, and thank you really to all of our witnesses for this uh, this really deep, important, uh, if somewhat chaotic uh, uh, hearing. We are going to need to rush off to, to do floor votes, but um, uh, I'd like to thank you all again. Without objection, all members will have 10 legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as prompt promptly as you are able. Without objection, all members will have 10 legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members that written questions and materials for the record should be submitted to the email address provided to your offices. I thank our witnesses again. This hearing is adjourned.